So um, that's a hard act to follow. <laughs> uh, but we'll go down to earth uh, and talk about snails. I think that's a good contrast to the expanding universe. Um, and we work on a group of marine organisms, the cone snails, and uh, people usually don't think of snails as venomous, uh, but all of these snails, 700 species, uh, catch their prey with venom. And in fact, what I'm going to talk about today are the particular species that are able to capture fish and use fish as their specialized prey. So how do you capture a fish? Uh, this shows you how. And what you see is a snail extending its proboscis towards the fish. And this is real time. And what you'll see is that everything happens very, very fast. So the snail extends its proboscis, harpoons the fish, and very quickly makes a meal out of the fish. And so that's uh, typical of what, what these snails do. So it's uh, unusual that an astronomy talk introduced uh, this topic, but this is the product of evolution, of course. This is the venom apparatus, and the long tube is where the ducks are made. Uh, but they use a harpoon-like tooth uh, in order to tether the fish. And so they have a harpoon-shaped uh, tooth. But this tooth is amazing because not only does it tether the fish, uh, but it's also hollow. And so the venom flows from the proboscis tip through the harpoon uh, to the end of the harpoon. And the fish is not only tethered, uh, but the venom is injected, and this tooth is only used once. Uh, and so this is a group of snails that basically uh, develop disposable hypodermic needles as a drug delivery device about 60 million years ago, and that's why they've been successful ever since. And the shape of the harpoon-like tooth varies from species to species, uh, so here's another tooth. Uh, but what our work has been is to try to understand how a, how a snail is able to paralyze a fish. Uh, and it turns out that what these snails use are small peptides, and five of them from a single venom are shown there. And that's what we isolated, five different peptides, uh, any one of which is sufficient uh, to paralyze a fish. And so the question is, why five? And it turns out that all five peptides act where the motor nerve and the skeletal muscle meet. And what you see is a diagram uh, of the important components. At the end of a nerve, there's a calcium channel, which is blocked by one set of peptides. And uh, at the muscle end of the synapse, there's an acetylcholine receptor, which is blocked by another set of peptides. And finally, uh, there are sodium channels that carry uh, the muscle action potential, and that's blocked by yet another set of peptides. So in other words, the snails are using combination drug therapy. They discovered this principle 55 million years ago, and for anything they want to do physiologically, uh, they use not a single pharmacological compound, but a whole combination. And they've carried things even further, uh, because in fact, uh, what they're able to do is uh, they use one set of peptides uh, at one site of a particular ion channel called the acetylcholine receptor. And so uh, for you to be able to move any muscle, acetylcholine receptors have to open up uh, from a closed state to an open state. Uh, and the green uh, dot there shows the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Uh, but the snails block the binding of acetylcholine uh, with the red toxin, and as a result, uh, the receptor is stuck in the closed state and doesn't open up, so that causes paralysis. But just to show you how thorough evolution is, uh, in case any receptor escapes the red toxin, uh, the snails have a fail-safe toxin. And so any receptor that opens up is then blocked at a second site where the, the channel is plugged. Uh, and so you can see that 
these snails are carrying combination drug therapy to an extreme. Not only do they hit different molecules in the same physiological circuit, they hit different sites on the same molecule just to make sure they wipe it out. Now, we call groups of toxins that act together uh, for a particular physiological end a cabal. After all, cabals are secret societies out to overthrow existing authority. Uh, and so these toxins overthrow the normal physiology of the prey. And what you see are the components of what we call the motor cabal. Well, it turns out that you can take any of these components, or all of them in combination, and inject them into a fish. And it still takes you 20 or 30 seconds to paralyze a fish. Why? Because this, the, the components of the venom have to get from the site of injection to where they're going to act, which is the neuromuscular junctions. And so they have to enter the circulation, and that has a transit time of 20 to 30 seconds. But if you looked at the video, you saw that the snail was able to paralyze the fish in less than a second. And the reason, it turns out, is uh, that they have developed the equivalent of a taser. And so, of course, today we don't use poison arrows, which is what the motor cabal does, uh, muscle paralysis. Uh, we use tasers in uh, our own society today uh, because you've got to stop uh, a predator much faster. Uh, and so these snails discovered the same principle. And so instead of simply paralyzing the muscle, which is the job of the first cabal, uh, it turns out that they have a second cabal, which we call the lightning strike cabal. So the components of the lightning strike cabal, uh, these show you two peptides and their structures uh, that are the major components. And I'll show you uh, how these act. So within uh, the nervous system of a fish, you have uh, action potentials coming at a certain rate. Uh, and those action potentials are carried by sodium channels in blue, which open up and then very quickly are inactivated. And the signal is terminated by potassium channels shown in brown, which let potassium out of the cell. And so this combination of sodium and potassium channels discovered by Hodgkin and Huxley originally uh, is what allows a transient action potential to pass through an axon. So how do you subvert this physiology if you're a snail? And how that's done is shown here. The snail injects the fish. And when it injects the fish, there are two toxins. And one of these toxins is called a delta toxin. And it binds to sodium channels. And what happens is when this toxin binds to sodium channels, sodium channels remain open. They don't close as they normally do. And there's a second toxin called a kappa toxin, which basically blocks potassium channels. The net effect of this is when an excitation arrives at this site, it never leaves. That part of the axon remains continuously excited, and therefore, Within the fish, the injection site becomes the equivalent of an epileptic focus, causing the firing of the whole nervous system, causing a very, very stiff fish. This is a strategy that's not only employed by cone snails, but also by scorpions and also by uh, sea anemones. Now, what you'll see here is uh, the lightning strike cabal and the snail is going to try to find uh, the fish, and when it injects it, what you're going to see is the lightning strike cabal in full action. And uh, in this case, it won't happen very fast, uh, but the net result is the same. The fish is immobilized, and you can see how stiff this fish is, and what's happening is from the site of injection, uh, because of these two toxins, you have this uncontrolled firing the whole nervous system is hyperactivated. Uh, and so as a result, although this, as you can see, the fish is not yet completely paralyzed, its gills are still moving. Uh, it has very, very stiff fins, and it's basically unable to move. And I think you'll agree with me that you've never seen such a fish stiff, uh, stiff fish in your life. So look at the fins of that, that fish. So they use two cabals, a lightning strike cabal, 
and a mortar cabal. Why, why do you need both if the lightning strike cabal is so effective? And this video shows you why. So this is the fastest immobilization we've ever seen uh, by a fish hunting cone snail. Notice how fast that was. Uh, the fish is almost completely immobilized in less than a second. But what's remarkable about this video is that what you're going to see is that the fish is going to recover. And so it's being tethered, swallowed, and it's the excitotoxic shock syndrome is going on. But what you see is the fish now recovering. But of course, in this particular case, it's too late. <laughs> so our work really uh, developed from an undergraduate uh, in Utah who took a single venom and he injected each component of the venom shown by a peak into a mouse. And this was many years ago. And what Craig Clark showed was that there was a peak that caused mice to jump and twist as they're jumping. There was a peak that made mice uncoordinated. There was a peak that put mice to sleep. Another peak put, made them drag their back legs. Another peak made them run around in circles. Another peak made them swing their heads back and forth. These are all components of the same venom. And so what we discovered was there were 200 different components of the venom, and there was this extremely diverse pharmacological activity. And that's when we realized that the venom wasn't simply a few paralytic toxins, but was this very complex mixture. And ever since then, uh, we've been trying to figure out what all the components of these venom, uh, venoms do. So uh, we had a whole slew of undergraduates in the early days, uh, young kids that could choose any snail they wanted, and one young guy chose Conus Magus, uh, the magician's cone, uh, and this is what he looked like uh, when he purified the component shown in black in the graph, uh, which he called the shaker peptide. So why am I telling you this? Because this component that was uh, purified by this undergraduate, uh, which he called the shaker peptide, and which has the structure shown here, is today a drug for intractable pain. Uh, and what's interesting is that uh, the biotech company that developed this uh, spent two years trying to change various functional groups to improve it. Uh, but the, in the end, what they went with was exactly what the snails make. They haven't changed a single functional group uh, in this. And this is a drug for pain. We call it omega conotoxin. Uh, but today it's called pre-alt uh, for primary alternative to morphine. Uh, and the reason it is such an effective drug is because it only hits uh, one particular type of calcium channel, which happens to be found in the dorsal horn, uh, where pain fibers come in. And, uh, and what you see is an animal model of pain. And so uh, the, the, uh, the drug is only used uh, when morphine no longer works, because morphine is much cheaper, uh, much simpler to use. And what this shows is an animal model of pain, and if you inject morphine in the green, you reduce the pain on the first day, and if you uh, inject the peptide, you reduce the pain as well. The problem with morphine, as uh, I'm sure many people in this room know, is that if the pain continues, after a while, morphine doesn't work anymore. And that's because it hits a kind of receptor called a G-protein coupled receptor, which intrinsically downregulates uh, when it's uh, exposed to agonist. But because this peptide acts directly on an ion channel, as you can see, after seven days, uh, it still works perfectly well. So what I'd like to close with is to just show you uh, that by knowing the phylogeny of the cone snails and looking at another group of cone snails shown by the blue arrow. Uh, so there are four different groups of fish hunting cone snails uh, represented by Fs. Uh, it turns out that they have a very different biology. When you drop a fish in, uh, instead of sticking their proboscis, they open their mouths. And what you can see uh, is this snail opening its mouth. And you can see it has quite a large mouth, quite a cavernous mouth. And here's another snail of the same clade. And this guy has frills at the end of his mouth. and so. He engulfs the fish first. And so they engulf the fish before they sting. And we call this the net strategy. And indeed, uh, what happens is these snails crawl out of the reef at night. And uh, if they're lucky, they go after schools of sleeping fish. 
And if they're lucky, they bag the whole school and they can pick them off one by one. But if they injected a fish in their mouth and if, and if they had a lightning strike cabal, then what would happen is that the fish would twirl around with very stiff fins and that's not a good idea if the fish is already in your mouth. Uh, and so instead, what these snails have, they do not have a lightning strike cabal, they do not have those components in their venom. What they have instead is what we call the nirvana cabal uh, because this group of toxins makes the fish behave as if they're in an opium den. Uh, they look all uh, relaxed, sedated, uh, and so the components of this venom, uh, of this nirvana cabal, are able to make the fish hypoactive. Uh, and these are some of the components of, uh, of the nirvana cabal. Uh, they're, they all quiet down neuronal circuitry. And so knowing this behavior, we can ask the question, uh, can this have some use uh, in pathological conditions where you have neuronal circuitry that's too active? Uh, and indeed, uh, two members of the nirvana cabal, uh, one of the, which we originally called the sluggish peptide, uh, which is actually a modified version of, the pep of a well-known neuropeptide called neurotensin, has reached human clinical trials for intractable pain uh, and uh, the, sorry, for, uh, for intractable pain. And the second uh, component of this venom of the nirvana cabal uh, has reached human clinical trials for intractable epilepsy. So you can see that knowing about the biology of uh, the snails gives you a hint as to how the different components uh, of the snails, uh, can, of these venoms, can be used for, uh, for uh, biomedical purposes. And I think since we're running a little bit late, uh, I'll stop there, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you for your attention.